interested, and we'll turn it over to you, Rabbi A.B. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, um, it's exciting to be back again. I'm exciting for the Jewish Community Center to partner with Jason and with Shoshana and Beit Abu Lafia. Um, and so we're excited to be here. We're excited to be sharing this space together. Um, and I want to turn it over to you, Jason. Great, Rabbi Abi, thank you. Thank you to the Memphis Jewish Community Center and the Center for Jewish Living and Learning. And thank you to Shoshana Sanker for hosting and moderating and for our special guest, Professor Elliot Wilson for joining us. Um, I'd like to read his bio and um, start here. Uh, Elliot Wolfson received Bachelor and Master of Arts degree from Queens College of City University of New York, where he pursued the study of philosophy, focusing on, especially on phenomenology, hermeneutics, and existentialism. He received Masters of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy degrees from Brandeis University, where he specialized in the study of Kabbalistic texts and traditions that have remained central to his scholarly work. He was the Abraham Lieberman Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University, where he taught between 1987 and early 2014. And on this, there's a personal webpage with art and writings and listings, and we are so thrilled to have you, and welcome Professor Wolfson. <laughs> so to get started, uh, I think I would start, Shoshana, with you to help us moderate. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Professor, for being with us. Um, I feel like there's no way to pack everything we want to in the short time, but we're going to do our best. Um, and I guess if you don't mind, Professor, if we could sort of start with an unfair question is we know that you have this direct connection with Beit Abu Lafi and a lot of the people that we've had previously have been musicians and other types of, of um, their connection to Beit Abu Lafi has come through music. You're a teacher, you're a professor. So can you share with us, again, the unfair ask, because I'm sure you could talk for so long. How is it that you directly connected with Beit Abu Lafi and then what you gained from that connection? Well, I, uh, I do want to say one thing that I, I am currently still teaching at University of California in Santa Barbara. So. I know. I don't know why that was in your bio. So excuse me for leaving that. You see Santa Barbara currently teaching. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want the, uh, the administration here to fly it. <laughs> right. Um, so I learned about Beit Abelafia through uh, Jason's email, um, introducing himself and the Beit Abelafia to me and uh, sent me some links and um, suggested the possibility of having this, this meeting, this encounter. And so that's how I learned about it, to be, to be completely candid, yeah. Right. Um, and obviously I feel, uh, you know, uh, a special connection to to the whole the whole enterprise here because Abulafia has been, you know, one of one of the Kabbalists whom I've been studying for now close to four decades. So then maybe we back up and maybe you can share with us your journey to and through Kabbalah and how that's influenced you and then move back to Beit Abu Lafia and, and maybe some of the takeaways that you've gained from that. Okay. Okay, so I was, uh, um, you know, I'll give the short version of the bio. Um, I was raised uh, in an Orthodox home. Uh, my father was an Orthodox rabbi. So I've been around traditional Jewish texts and rituals uh, since, since I was a small child. Um, and like, you know, most people from my kind of background, Kabbalah was not featured as a major part of our curriculum. However, since I grew up in Brooklyn, um, where, you know, the streets were, the streets of my neighborhood were dominated with refugees from Eastern Europe. Um, and particularly imp important was the influence of Chabad, which e even though that was in Crown Heights, you know, the Rebbe had already created a whole network of emissaries or shaluchim who spread out to different parts of Brooklyn. So, uh, and also one of my teachers in the sixth grade, I believe my Talmud teacher was a Lubavitcher. So he used to bring 
some of the teachings of his tradition to us, especially on Fridays. So already before my bar mitzvah, I started to be familiar with, with Chabad teaching. Of course, I didn't really understand yet how Hasidism related to Kabbalah. But then uh, as I uh, entered into my teenage years, I also got interested in uh, Nachman of Bratzlav, and I started to study uh, his works. So I had, you know, some familiarity with uh, Hasidism, and then um, eventually through, it was really through the study of philosophy that I got more and more interested in the phenomenon of mysticism, and then eventually I you know, decided to delve more deeply in, into the Kabbalah. And you know, I picked that up when I went to Brandeis to work on first my master's and then my doctorate. So is, is it fair to say that it's been influential in several stages of your life and still is today? Oh yeah, uh, I mean, I'm. I'm no longer, you know, I'm, I don't no longer live within an orthodox framework, mm -hmm. um, but um, all of those influences have shaped and informed my life. I always know what I'm not supposed to be doing, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but more seriously, of course, I mean, not only my scholarly work, which has been dedicated to the exposition or explication of Kabbalistic sources, but it's it's informed every every aspect of my life, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor, I want you to answer this question too, but I want Jason to share with us first, if you don't mind, Jason. We've talked a lot about in these sessions, um, what are some actual takeaways that we can learn from Abraham Abulafi and his teachings? Because a lot of times we've talked about how people feel like it's too high level, that there's not a way to connect with it. We can't bring it down to where we're holding in our life. So there are some very real solid ways that we can implement these things in our life. Can you share some of those that people have shared before? And then Professor Wilson, if you would also share some of your thoughts on that after Jason. Great, yeah, and again, thank you for Professor Wilson for joining us. I think we're gonna need a one or two or three part series if he can if he can handle our requests. Um, but I, I guess I just wanna be very brief because um, I have found that for me in my journey, Abraham Abulafi has been presented as a very far out, very far high level mystic. I found him very practical, very universal, very down to earth saying that prophecy is in the real uh, grasp of people if we work hard enough. So I, I think my interest uh, tonight is, uh, you know, R Professor Wolfson is so uh, gracious to, to join us, but he, he really is to me, not the expert, but a expert of, of Abulafi. So I'm very curious just to hear your adventure through Abulafia. Um, one of the things I wanted to share tongue in cheek is that I was studying Professor Wilson and I, and I said to a friend, I'd love to just speak to him. I, don't, I can't break into the writing. I'm not academically trained. And this is a thrill for me. This is just a thrill to speak to him directly and, and hear his thoughts. So I know a little bit about how music helped me understand Abulafia, but I probably have scratched the surface. So I, I, yeah, Professor Wilson, as Shoshana said, we'd be very interested to hear about your thoughts on Abulafia and maybe, maybe where he fits with today's jewelry. Okay. Um, well, um, you know, um, according to the uh, the well-known rabbinic maxim, "Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim." These and those are the words of the living God. Which is to say, it is both true that Abulafia is quite abstract and pretty high level, but it is also true, as you said, Jason that there's a sense in which what he's presenting and dedicated his life to proliferate is very down to earth, very concrete. And he did, in, he did indeed believe that prophecy was something accessible. And this is one of the reasons why he was ostracized by a leading uh, Spanish rabbinic authority who also was a Kabbalist, Salman Ibn Aderet, right, who uh, 
not only criticized Abulafia, but made it impossible for his works to be copied and studied in Spain because he was upset that Abulafia was explicitly articulating a, a practice that could lead people to have prophetic states of illumination. <clears throat> and uh, Abulafia is famous for the distinction that scholars have used beginning with uh, 19th century German Jewish scholar Adolf Jelinek, and then continued by Gershom Sholem, and then most, most famously in the 20th and 21st century by Moshe Edel, between the so-called uh, Theosophic Kabbalah and the Ecstatic Kabbalah. Abulafi's own terms that he uses are the Kabbalah Tafsirot, that's what's translated as the Theosophic Kabbalah, that is to say the Kabbalah, the tradition that is focused on these 10 emanations of the divine, and his own Kabbalah, which he calls Kabbalah Hanavuit, prophetic Kabbalah, because it's a Kabbalah, a tradition that, uh, that is uh, based on a meditational practice that leads to this uh, state of prophecy. Um, uh, by the way, at any point, interrupt me if you want to say something or want me to explain better what I'm saying. Um, so you're right, Jason, that this is something that Abulafia believed what could be available to all. We'll get to the question of the universal, uh, but for, for the moment, let's leave that aside. Uh, but the nature of the prophecy uh, is very much informed by uh, Balafia's study of Maimonides. So the way he characterizes prophecy is the union of the human intellect and what he calls the active intellect, okay? also identified as the angel Metatron. So prophecy, essentially for Abulafia is the unitive state whereby the individual is angelically transfigured into Metatron, like Enoch of old. Right? So in that unitive state, in that transfiguration, the individual assumes an angelic body, which supplants the physical body. So it's, it, is, it, isn't a, it isn't an easy matter in the least. It's a very complex state of disembodied consciousness that Abulafia is describing. Of course, where he significantly parts company with Maimonides is that Abulafia thought that the, 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 the path what he calls the derech, the way to get there was through the meditational technique of letter combination, tzeruf otiot, or what he also calls the wisdom of combination, chachmat ha-tzeruf. Now Maimonides would have been outraged by that idea, right? But this is the very peculiar character of Abulafia that he mixed Maimonides' philosophy with these older streams of Jewish mysticism. So he, 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 was a, he was an ultimate synthesizer of the Germanic Chazdei, uh, Ashkenaz, and Maimonides. And I, I, probably both schools would not have agreed with either school. Somehow he bridged the gap. Right. Very, very much so. He was a, a synthesizer or a, a bridge. Bridge is a good way to, to, to think of him. Yeah. So, so as a follow-up, did, did you think he was successful in this? Was he watering each system down, or did you do you like what he's done with that? No, I wouldn't say he's, he watered it down. I mean, um, you know, there is there's definitely poetic license in what he did, um, um, but you know, he, this is part of his genius, you know. And I think was he successful? Look, he he had definitely had students in his own time. Um, and in terms of the afterlife, you know, we see that 
you know, his works continued to have an impact on Kabbalistic circles and up up until the up until the present you know. i mean i i find him very compelling i think he's a wonderful bridge and you know when i study maimonides i still feel like there's a silent um transcendent god that it's very hard to have a relationship with and i study the kabbalists i feel like i'm losing touch with reality a little bit in terms of you know um anti-rationalism or anti-philosophy and he's able to live in both worlds it helps me live in both worlds and I wonder if if you've seen that kind of benefit or other benefits you you see from him. Uh, well, I understand what you mean in the case of Maimonides, yeah, and um, you know that in, one has to wonder. Although Maimonides tried his best to live his life as a committed Jew, and you know made an argument for it. He wrote the Mishnah Torah, right? <laughs> That's not a small achievement. Uh, but when you read you read his uh, philosophical work, you really have to wonder, you know, how does one sustain a living relationship to the God he's describing, you know, who seems to be you. I think you said transcendent. Who seems to be so out of reach. And, and at some point in the first part of the guide, chapter 59, Maimonides famously says that, you know, the, the ultimate apprehension of God is that we cannot apprehend God. And therefore he quotes Psalms, silence is praise to thee, right? So I understand that. I don't quite feel the same about the other Kabbalah. I don't, I don't know that it's quite anti-rational. Um, um, there's less of an effort mm -hmm. to incorporate Maimonides, although, you know, Maimonides is not unimportant for other Kabbalists, but Abelafik clearly made it a central concern of his. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I, there, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, of course, there's also the question of why did he distinguish between these two streams of Kabbalah or these two types of Kabbalah? It was very rare in the uh, latter part of the 13th century. You know, Ablafi is the only one who, who did such a thing. And why did he do it? So one reason was because he was responding to the criticism of him. Because he was so sharply criticized, he wanted to argue that he was the one who actually had the true Kabbalah. The, right? So that's one reason. Um, But you know, it's also the case that um, I think that he believed that his understanding of Kabbalah was a more authentic Jewish tradition because on the face of it, it rejected the idea of the Sfirot as the divine potencies. You know, which would introduce a kind of multiplicity into the nature of God. Right, right. right. I, I think that's that's very helpful. I'm just thrilled to be doing this call. I don't want to have a private discussion, Shoshana, so if I can kick it over to you, I realized I was kind of going on a No, 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 it's there. okay. You're geeking out, I like it. Um, Absolutely. Professor, throughout your studies and, and your learnings and what you've been reading, was there anything that you came across that was surprising to you or that you didn't see coming or something maybe that especially resonated with you in all the learnings? Uh, I mean, um, You're like, yes, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say the, the most amazing thing is, you know, I've been really at this a long time at this point. Um, and it's still mysterious to me. I'm still chasing it. I'm still trying to get it. So I think all of it has surprised me. <laughs> right. If somebody is out and they don't know where to start, what approach would you recommend they go with? For Abel Afia? Yeah, or to start learning, to, to, to bring it into their life, to 
um, have, I don't know, sort of an, an awakening that this can present in their life. Again, are you referring specifically to Abulafia or mm -hmm. to Kabbalah? Well, or, specifically or, to Abulafia, but any of the other teachings that, you, that uh -huh. you've that you been learning or that you teach yourself, sure. Yeah, well, well, let's start with Abulafia. Now, uh, for, for Hebrew readers, there's now the, the advantage that most of Abulafia's works have been published, right? And this was not the case. Um, it, it really began, I guess, about a decade ago, or maybe a little bit more. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit more. But now they're all available. I mean, the, for, the scholars still should be checking the manuscripts to be candid. But nev nevertheless, for the Hebrew reader, there's now available a wealth of material. Um, for those who are capable of dealing with with scholarly uh, scholarly research, there's also you know qu uh, quite a bit that is now available. Um, for those who might not have access to either the Hebrew text or the kind of sometimes abstruse scholarly uh, language, you know, there, there are other places to look. I, I think Arya Kaplan's Meditation on Kabbalah is an excellent, still an excellent place to start for people to be introduced into, well, into, you know, the history of meditational techniques in the Kabbalah more generally, but specifically with regard to Abulafia, because Kaplan, was an unusual man. He died. He died quite young, but he was very interested in Nabulafia. You know. So, and he he you know he understood. He understood the material, and I think he does a good job of of translating it. Um, I'm sure there are. I'm not so familiar in here. I would, you know. Uh, be glad to be assisted on this, but I'm sure there are individuals who are teaching Abulafian meditation. There must be. Uh, there, we have a growing number of people that will come on the show, but I, we haven't vetted them specifically, but we've had pre-calls and we find them very interesting. So uh, uh, we, we found some people here in Israel and um, in America, but I think you're right. I think Professor Wilson, the uh, Ari Kaplan books for our audience is is amazing. The Meditation Kabbalah, and just his book Jewish Meditation was the first Jewish yeah. book I read when I was coming back. Even that mentions Abulafia. I think Ari Kaplan really saw the future. He talks about the importance of Chabad and Breslov and Abulafia and all these people yeah. that were very in minority status in the Jewish world when he was writing, and have become so mainstream now. He really saw the future. Right. Very interesting man. Um... From Brooklyn, by the way. Yes. The Hometown hero. <laughs> yeah. Very, very close to where I grew up. Um, so I, I had the, the opportunity uh, about, a, about again, it was almost, I think it was like in 2013 to visit his home. Now, he passed away a long time ago, but his widow continued to live, you know, in the home where he lived. And I saw the library was there intact. I don't know what, if it still is, but I saw I saw exactly, you know, um, the materials that uh, he was able to use. And Abulafia was a, you know, he was definitely um, a critical figure in his understanding. Yeah, and so he was. I quite agree with you. In many ways, he was. He was prescient. He was he was a, he, he was ahead of his time. So, if I could do a follow up question, um, a lot of what we do on Beta Abulafia is, you know, again, and full disclaimer with my probably five percent knowledge of Abulafia, we I've really seen a connection between the music, um, and and you told me in, in some of our pre calls that you also love music or improvisational music. Um, do you see some of the combinations that are used in jazz music that could be the combinations of Hebrew, or have you seen other writings where he mentions this? Well, I, I, I'm a lover of jazz music, but I'm not, you know, I'm not um, conversant enough to be able to answer that kind of technical question. Uh, that would be interesting 
it will be interesting for a jazz mu musician to answer. Um, but I, I could, what, the, what I could contribute is that I do think that for Abulafia, the, the, the letter combination, you know, which he specifies in three stages, you know, the, the first stage is the writing of the combinations. And then the second is the oral recitation of the combinations. And the third stage is the mental contemplation. So I, I, I would, I, I would think that there is fruitful ground to make this analogy. And he himself does describe the process as akin to music. Now, he does I, say. Yeah. Now, some some later followers of Kabbalah actually you know, created chants based on. Abulafia, or the Abulafian techniques. But Abulafia himself, as far as I know, did not, you know, did not speak of chants, actually. But what he did say is that when you do the combinations, you hear music huh. as a result of doing, of doing the, the, the letter permutations. That's what he says. Okay, it is written. Okay, that's great. We'll have to we'll have to talk sources there. That's wonderful to know. Yeah, and, and one other point on that, and the, the the nexus or the connection between music and prophecy is an old one in Jewish sources. Right, it has some allusions even in, in biblical texts, but it's also you know um, uh, expanded in in rabbinic sources. Uh, so that connection is there, and Abulafi is undoubtedly building upon that connection. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I want to. I just want to respond to a great question from one of the audience members, um, Bracha. Um, well, we can send out emails about. Yes, um, there are meditation people that do chanting uh, that I've seen videos of, and uh, one of the rabbis who does it in Israel hopefully have. And so there's a lot of chanting of letters and turning of heads. And I'm particularly not drawn to that. I really like taking melodies on a piano and keeping it simple and making beautiful melodies and having it very dynamic and fast. I, I can't, my, my brain's too fast for the slow chanting. So there are varieties out there and I, and I sure there's utility to all of them. Um, particularly Beit Abulafi, it's really about melodies and seeing all the different angles of a melody. And I found that teaching that, we did one last night uh, here at a uh, music studio in Memphis. So we'll, we certainly will follow up with that. I just want to make sure I answer that. Yeah. So if I could go ahead, Professor Wilson. That uh, the uh, different bodily postures or the movements of the head, that is in Abulafia, actually. Yes, yes. I was saying that that is where I've seen people do the movement of the heads and they follow the, his track dates uh, really closely on that. Yeah. And I, mean, I is that in, is that in Arya Kaplan's book, Professor Wilson? I think he shows a diagram. I, I think I so. Uh, I'll, I'll put it off the shelf. It, it's there. I, I think so. Yeah, it's been yeah. a long time since I looked at that book, but I, I, I think it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let me grab it. And um, okay. Shoshana, let me let me pause myself again. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah no, you're good. Um, so, Professor, something that I've noticed in each of these sessions is that I think it's remarkable that something like Abu Lafia and Kabbalah and all these meditation thoughts that are from hundreds of years ago are still so valid and applicable today. Um, they're just more in need, I think, now than ever. And I wonder if you could speak to that about how we have such ancient texts and learnings that like are now still relevant. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I quite agree. Um, I guess there are certain, you know, with all, with all of the changes and, you know, we live in a dramatically different time than Abulafia in the 13th century, obviously. Um, but nevertheless, some of the some of the spiritual needs that he tapped into have persisted, and they remain they remain to be um, you know spiritual needs that we still have. Um, it is important, though, and I guess this is this is the scholarly part of me. It is important to understand Abulafia as any. Kabbalist or any mystic in different traditions in 
his or her historical context. Right? In my mind, by heeding the historical context, one can even appreciate better the trans-historical dimension of these mystics, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't detract, it only enhances it. And this gets to the question of the universalism, right? Um, there's no question that for his time, Abulafi was quite remarkable to the extent that he wished to at least include both the Muslim and Christian in his messianic vision. I mean, he knew he knew of traditions from the Far East, but he's mostly because he's in, you know, mostly most of his time was on the European continent. So like other figures of his time, he's mostly concerned with what we call the Abrahamic religions, right? And he does accord to Islam and Christianity a significant role in the messianic drama. And I should have said that before that in addition to prophecy, Abulafia understood the illumination as messianic in nature. For him, those converge. So he does, he does accord a role to the other faiths, but the privileging of the Jewish people is also something that he thought was essential to his understanding of the Kabbalah. Perhaps it's best, uh, best uh, depicted by the tale, the tale of the three rings as it's referred to. And this is something that Abulafi didn't create, but he, he does have his own version of it. And so the three, th three rings essentially are the three Abrahamic faiths. And so there is, there is you know, the, the privilege, there's the father, the privileged son for whom a pearl is given, and the two servants who try to take the, per the pearl away. And until the son becomes worthy, the son cannot reclaim the, the pearl. But there's no question that the son is the Jewish people. The two servants are respectively Christianity and Islam. So I, I mean, I would I would say and I, 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 can't, I anticipated this might come up. So um, this might get a little complicated, but um, there is. Uh, the, uh, let, let me try to explain it this way. So for Abulafia, there is one language which he calls the essential language or the natural language, and that's the holy language of Hebrew. All other languages, he says, are a matter of convention. Okay. Yet he tries to make a connection in a in a way that is a little bit difficult to understand logically. But he says that all of the 70 languages, which is the marker for all the other languages, are contained within Hebrew. And he illustrates this by a numerology. Um, the Shivim Lishonot, which is the Hebrew expression for the 70 languages, is numerically equivalent to um, the wisdom of permutation. Right? Yeah. And, yeah, and this allows them to even say, you can do the meditational technique in languages other than Hebrew, right? So this is leaning more towards the universal side of things. And I agree to that, however, we can't ignore the other side of it. But yeah. it is still Hebrew that is given a, a privileged place. 
And the Jewish people are still referred to as nivchar, as chosen amongst the nations for Abu Afia, right? I feel like he can do, I feel like if I could submit to you, this sounds like he can do both again. He can be Kabbalist and a philosopher. He can be a particularist and a universalist. I just, I find it fascinating that he, he doesn't surrender any of the areas. I agree with him. Okay. But, but, but the, the critical thing is that it's both. He's trying to burn the candle at both ends. Right, so he's not embracing a universalism that would completely eradicate the particularism. That would right. not, that won't be a proper understanding of love of here. That's very clear. That's extremely helpful. Yeah. We've just got um, a few minutes left here with our session. Professor, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you can think of that you would wanna share? Or Jason, do you have any final questions? I have more questions. I have a thousand. Hours worth. I know. I know. There's no time. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I just wondered if in your studies did you did you practice the techniques? I know Gershom Shalom mentioned that he tried them, and then stepped away from it because it was too much. And I don't know if it's a personal question. I just wonder if a scholar of your um, in-depth experience with Abilafia tried it or had similar experiences. Yeah. Well. Um... Well, I, I, I'm from a different generation than Sholem and from a different place, you know, uh, not Berlin, but Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> um, and so I personally don't have such a sharp distinction between the scholar and the adept. Oh. I, don't, I don't see how a scholar can really study this material without being immersed in it and it's on delving into it. So I don't, how can one understand Abulafia unless one actually attempts to, to practice the teaching he's promulgating in his writings? That's, you know, so um, yeah, I, I mean. I Without think, detail, you'd like to say yes. Yeah, right, right. Okay, gotcha. Okay, good. Understood. Thank you. That That is very helpful because I, I felt when I studied Shalom that he just wanted to study him but wanted to remain like uh, an outsider looking into the to the fishbowl of Abulafia. It was it was hard to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, people use this uh, analogy that you know Shalom was like the accountant. So he's counting the money, but the money wasn't his. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, now, I, you know, I who really knows what Sholem? I know, I know what you're referring to. Sholem famously, I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was, uh, when I, one of my first trips to Jerusalem, when I was studying yeshiva, so I would have been 17 or 17. I went into one of these uh, old bookstores in Jerusalem, and the guy had a copy. It wasn't an original. It was a, a Xerox copy but it was a, a, a text, an Abulafia text, and he claimed it came from Sholem's library. And at the time I was a student, I, didn't, I couldn't afford it. Uh, so I had to let it slip out of my hands. That was, in, that was interesting. <laughs> that is very interesting to have the possibility of that connection to hold that safer. Right, right. So my, my other follow-up question is, I, I've never understood the idea of Abulafi going to the Pope to convert him. I, I thought maybe he was trying to sit with the Pope and say, Pope, can we all work together and be the three rings together? I, I don't think you'd go to convert him. And I, I mean, it's a strange story. Do you have insights in that to help us with that? Yeah. So I'm, I am the only scholar of uh, Jewish mysticism to raise doubt about that story. I don't believe it happened. And the reason I don't believe it happened is because even it, at that time, it was not easy to get an audience with the Pope, okay? And especially somebody like Abulafia, who was not a Maimonides or a Nachmanides. He didn't have any real standing. Now, what Abulafia did is he tells the story in light of historical facts to make it seem as if it's an actual story. But I think it's part of his fantasy, his imagination. And he 
in my opinion, he weaves the story in order to make the point that he, Abulafia, possesses the true key for salvation, the true messianic doctrine. And there's a very sharp criticism in Abulafia's writings against Christianity. He even refers to Jesus as the Antichrist. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Because of because of his idea of being exclusively a son of God and exclusively a prophet, or what, what, that was was that the critique? Yeah, and and that it's it's ultimately a, a, a based on a faulty outlook. So so as a follow up, it, did 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 but did he, he believe? I, I just want to say one thing. Sorry. Oh please, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. But, but you know, Abulafi is you know, never completely consistent. He also does speak of Christianity as being the sixth day as opposed to Judaism being the Sabbath. So in that, you know, that text, he seems to, again, lean, leaning towards a somewhat more positive view that Christianity is a kind of preparatory for, for, for Judaism, which is the Sabbath and the true messianic teaching. Wow. Wow, that's an excellent point. Yeah. So I, my follow-up is, did, 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 when he says or hints that he's the Messiah, is he talking about reaching a level of Mashiach in his soul, or is he saying historical Messiah? Do we really know the, the, the difference? Excellent question. So I, I think it's more the former. That is to say, what he understood by Messianism, and here's a point where Edel and I would agree, I believe, that what the, the heart of his Messianic teaching isn't so much to affect a change in history, a rebuilding of the temple, re reinstitution of the sacrifices, an ingathering of all the exiles. He's talking about a change in consciousness, a spiritual awakening. So what he means by Messiah goes back to its biblical roots. The Mashiach is an anointed one. So, for instance, in, in Chaye Olam Abba, one of his major treatises, he describes the, after becoming Metatron, after being transfigured or transformed, he describes it by citing the verse from Isaiah, where, you know, the anointed one is described. So you have this, you know, tact, it's a tactile experience of being anointed. That's what he means by the, being the Mashiach. And so in that sense, everybody has the potential or the capacity to be Messianic. Fantastic, fantastic. I, I, I mean, and I think I know we have people listening on audio. We're gonna send this video out to a lot of people, but the, the um, insights gathered in this short 45 minute session has just been fantastic for me. I hope for you too, Shoshana and everyone on the session. Um, it's been a real treat. Thank you, Stuart. Um, it's been a real treat to have Professor Elliot Wilson with us. Um, we really do want to keep it to 45 minutes uh, for, for all of our times and, and, and just thank everyone for joining. Um, I feel like a part two could be in the horizon, you know, down the line. I just, I think we just got started. And um, I just want to thank you so much, uh, Professor Wilson. Just fantastic to, to have you here and your insights. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, and Shoshana, thank you for all the questions and thank you for the space for me to continue following up because it was just a fabulous uh, time. And Rabbi Abe, Abe uh, with the uh, Center for Jewish Living and Learning, thank you so much for your partnership and working with us. And the Memphis Jewish community, for everyone on the call and who's listening on the video when we post it, they're an incredible institution, so supportive. Um, I don't know where I would have gone other places. Say I have an Abulafia class idea and people would say, who, what, um, call us later. And they really said, we'd like to help you get that started. And it's just um, so much gratitude to the MJCC. So with that, Shoshan or Rabbi A.B., would you have final closing thoughts that you could share? Go ahead, Shoshana. Yeah, Shoshan, <laughs> no, if you'd like to go. I'll just no, no, I'll just say to Professor Wilson, thank you so much. Um, I agree with Jason. I feel like there's so much more and that you provide such tremendous insight and value. And we're so grateful that you joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, good. Rabbi Abi, any, any closing thoughts? No, but just such a pleasure to be with you and to learn from you, Professor Wilson. So thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, great. Everyone have a great, a great uh, evening and getting into Elul and the Yom Narayim so we can take new ideas, new spirituality, new thoughts and grow into new people and maybe not hit Metatron, but, um, you know, we could try. <laughs> Such a joy. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Okay. Bye.